Use premixed syringes. Absolutely never try to take a syringe of one to 10,000 epi and push half of a milliliter. That is a recipe for a dangerous overdose under stressful conditions. If somebody is going to push too much, your patient will have a tacky dysrhythmia. Take 30 seconds to mix it beforehand or get your hospital to get pre-mixed syringes of low-dose epinephrine and phenylephrine. Welcome to Critical Care Time, the podcast for everyone who cares for the critically ill. I'm your co-host, Dr. Cyrus Askin. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Nick Mark. On today's episode, we're going to talk about a topic that's near and dear to our hearts, or more appropriately, our vasculature. That's right. We're going to talk about all things vasopressors. But before we get into that, Cyrus, do you want to hear something horrifying that happened happened to me this morning? Lay it on me. All right. So driving my kids to summer camp, listening to the radio, cool, you know, 90s, 2000s music. And uh, this ad comes on and it's like, do you have cardiomyopathy? Do you have joint pains? You may have transthyretin amyloid cardiomyopathy. And this led me to this just a horrifying <laughs> oh revelation God. that the music that I thought was cool is now actually oldies. And people who listen to that music are getting uh, amyloid cardiomyopathy. Um, it's also That's a little bit scary so that bizarre. they're targeting like hyper local like that. That is so bizarre. It's like, it seems very niche to me as well. Like they could be... They could be advertising a statin or uh, one of the, you know, um, the GLP-1 uh, agents now that are that are all the rage. But no, it's a medication for a fairly uncommon condition. I, I can only guess that there <laughs> there are like two other – there are two people with uh, transthyretin amyloid in like the Seattle suburbs that, who listen to, mm -hmm. you know, oldies and uh, yeah. they are targeting them heavily. They're the big Green Day fans that also happen to have uh, hearts that don't squeeze too good. Exactly uh, right. <laughs> well, hey, that is uh, absurd and hilarious. I know we have a lot to get to, uh, so I think we should probably get started. Because we have so much to get to on this episode, we're actually going to do two different episodes. For the first episode, we're really going to focus on the presentation of the patient and how that patient might be managed in the emergency department. So, you know, for that uh, section, that's what we're going to cover today. We're going to discuss things like what are vasopressors and how do you choose the right one. We're going to talk about when you should start vasopressors, what the goal is, and how we titrate them. And then um, we're also going to cover whether or not you need a central line. All really important topics. Then in part two, we're going to tackle some of the more advanced questions. You can think about part one as kind of like the patient presents to the ED and what, what gets done in the ED. And you can think of part two as more of the more advanced or sort of ICU phase. So we'll talk about escalating, adding vasopressors. We'll talk about things you can do when vasopressors aren't working, situations like dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction, when to use adjuncts like steroids, and then uh, one of my favorite topics, thinking about um, scavenging vasodilators with drugs like methylene blue and hydroxycobalamin. And then finally, we'll conclude part two by talking about how you can help somebody wean from vasopressors as part of their recovery from critical illness. Throughout this two-part episode, we're going to stay focused on how we use vasopressors to care for the critically ill. Uh, and we're going to do that by following a patient's story from start to finish. It's going to be a lot of fun, so buckle up, folks. This brings us to act one of our discussion here. What are vasopressors, Nick? What a perfect way to get us started. So vasopressors are medications that increase vascular tone. They increase systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. Now, this usually has the benefit of raising blood pressure. There are many different blood pressures we can choose from, and they can have slightly different mechanisms of action. So we can classify them based on which receptors they act on. I think about it as kind of two big buckets. On one hand, we have the catecholamine vasopressors that stimulate alpha and beta adrenergic receptors. This includes drugs that are endogenous, like epinephrine, norepinephrine, and dopamine. And it also includes um, synthetic agonists like phenylephrine. In the second big bucket, we have the non-catecholamine vasopressors, which work on non-adrenergic receptors. These include drugs like vasopressin and angiotensin II. And to sort of double click on the catecholamine vasopressors, Nick, I think it's important for us to think about which adrenergic receptors they're working on. So we have our alpha-1 agonists and our beta-1 agonists. The alpha-1 agonists, they're going to increase muscle tone on vascular smooth muscle, which in turn increases SVR or systemic vascular resistance, whereas our beta-1 agonists are going to increase con uh, contractility and heart rate, overall increasing cardiac output. So, you know, Nick, I think you've got a nice framework for this, don't you? 
Well, thank you. Yeah. So I, I like to think of this as a speedometer, right? So you could think about it as, you know, on one end, on the extreme right, you have alpha agonists, pure alpha agonists. And on the left, you have beta agonists. And all of the drugs that we're going to talk about fit somewhere on this spectrum from left to right. And this is kind of a useful way to conceptualize how each presser works. So if we start off at the extreme right end of the speedometer, you've got phenylephrine, which is a pure alpha agonist, meaning that it raises SVR and does not increase cardiac output. In fact, it often decreases cardiac output because there's more afterload for the heart to pump against. Next up, kind of in the middle to middle right, we've got norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a strong alpha agonist, but it's got some beta-1 effects thrown in. This gives it a more balanced effect that primarily increases our SVR, but also slightly raises cardiac output. And this is probably advantageous because it sort of balances out that increased afterload by giving the heart a little bit more squeeze. Continuing a little farther to the left on our speedometer, we've got meds like epinephrine and dopamine, which both have a combination of alpha with a little bit more beta agonism and thus more cardiac effects. That's why we often tend to see more tachycardia and more arrhythmias with these drugs. Sometimes that's something we want. We want to use them for those inotrope effects, and sometimes it's undesirable. So Technically, the speedometer goes further to the left, but over here, we're not really in presser land anymore. We're really in inotrope land. So over here on the extreme left, we've got isoproteranol and dobutamine, but they aren't vasopressors. These are drugs that act as pure beta agonists, so they increase cardiac output there, but they're actually vasodilatory. So for the sake of completeness, we can include them on the presser speedometer, but just remember, these are drugs that we, are, we don't use as pressers. We use them as inotropes. And so based upon all that, there's a reason why guidelines for shock almost universally uh, recommend, excuse me, norepinephrine is the first line vasopressor for shock. It's, it's a very balanced drug. It gives us a balance of strong vasoconstriction along with some positive inotropy. Now, of course, there are exceptions to every rule, and norepinephrine as being the first-line presser in shock is no different. Uh, we're going to talk about some of these exceptions, but I would say that in undifferentiated shock, norepinephrine is usually a great choice because it provides a balanced approach to whatever that shock state may be. So with that being said, Nick, can you explain how vasopressors work physiologically? Yeah. So, so kind of diving into the physiology of this, vasopressors work in a couple different ways. The primary effect is as arterial vasoconstrictors. And what that means is, is that your, your arterial vascular tone is going to increase. That means that you have more um, squeeze on the vessels, which will maintain a higher pressure which helps perfuse um, distal organs better. This is particularly beneficial in distributive shock states, such as sepsis, anaphylaxis, where the fundamental problem is low SVR. But that's not all that vasopressors do. Vasopressors not only constrict the arteries, but they also constrict the veins. This effect, so-called venoconstriction, augments venous return to the heart. And this is why vasopressors can provide some benefit in other types of shock, like in hypovolemia. Even though they're not fixing the root cause there, they haven't restored circulating volume, by squeezing the veins, they increase venous return to the heart, and they can improve um, cardiac output for that reason. And then finally, as we touched on earlier, many of the vasopressors in the catecholamine group, um, including norepinephrine and particularly epinephrine and dopamine, are strong inotropes. These drugs increase SV, uh, uh, stroke volume and heart rate, which can be particularly beneficial in people with low cardiac output shock states. So that's why they're potentially useful in cardiogenic shock and maybe even obstructive shock. So to summarize, Vasopressors are most useful in distributive shock where they're fixing the core problem, which is low SVR, but they also provide some benefit in other types of shock, including hypovolemic and cardiogenic. And we should probably emphasize that vasopressors aren't going to fix every cause of shock. Vasopressors are great. They're highly effective drugs, uh, especially when, when used appropriately, but they are not cure-alls. So vasopressors, for example, they're not very good at treating an undiagnosed pneumothorax or, or a pericardial tamponade. Those things need a needle or a tube. And, and similarly, for hemorrhagic shock, they're not particularly effective either because those folks need volume. They need blood. So just recognize that vasopressors are very helpful. They often provide uh, a bridge to diagnostics. And sometimes they are the, the therapy of choice, but they're certainly not the be-all and end-all. That's exactly right. It's one thing to start a presser to temporize an acutely decompensating patient while you evaluate them and figure out why they're in shock. But it's important to remember that depending on the etiology of shock, vasopressors could either be beneficial and life-saving, or they could even be counterproductive. So I recommend to our listeners, go back and listen to episode one on undifferentiated shock, where we talk a lot more about this.
So before we get much further, Nick, we had discussed that there are some cases where norepinephrine might not be your first choice presser. So are there particular ones that come to mind? Yeah. So norepinephrine is a great general first choice, but there's a couple situations where maybe it's not the best choice. So um, one situation is somebody who's in cardiogenic shock. Often in, in this case, you might actually want a little bit more inotropy, and so choosing epinephrine first line might make sense. Another situation where epinephrine is a great first choice drug is anaphylactic shock. And the reason here is that it's uh, epinephrine has also got beta-2 effects, which cause bronchodilation. So it's actually got some other effects that are desirable there. Going in the other direction on the pressor speedometer, there's a couple situations where I actually like phenylephrine first. So for example, somebody who's got a pure drop in SVR. So for example, they have an epidural and they've got some systemic vasodilation. Often phenylephrine is a good place to start here. There's no evidence that it's really better, but just physiologically, it kind of makes sense. If the problem is, is a pure drop in SVR, a pure vasoconstrictor might balance that better. I don't think it's wrong to use norepi here. I just think that we often do use phenylephrine because of the physiology. And then finally, the last situation I think is probably a really important one, and we're going to talk more about this in part two, but this is the case of dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction. So in this situation, the concern is that adding a drug that has a lot of inotropy can actually make things worse by increasing the gradient across the LV outflow tract. And so in this situation, dynamic LV outflow tract obstruction, this is where I often reach for either vasopressin or phenylephrine first line. And we'll, and we'll talk more about this later. So we'll, we'll, we'll double click on that physiology in, in part two. Perfect. So, you know, now that we've laid what I think is a great foundation of physiology, uh, I think we should go ahead and introduce our first patient. And so without further ado, Ms. Gonzalez is a 65-year-old woman with a history of hypertension and rheumatoid arthritis who presented to the emergency department with dysuria and fever. She weighs 50 kilograms. And on her initial evaluation, we find that she has a leukocytosis and she has a, a UA that is worrisome for an infection. She's treated with antibiotics to cover a suspected urinary tract infection, and it seems as though all will be well. Initially, she is febrile to 39.7 centigrade. She's tachycardic with a heart rate of 120 to 130, but she is normotensive, uh, quote unquote, with a blood pressure of 111 over 42. Upon admission, or, uh, upon admission to the emergency department, I should say, she is satting fine, or her oxygen saturation is 98% on rim air. And she's borderline tachypnic, breathing 20 times a minute, but, but nothing too worrisome there. After she gets her antibiotics, she does defervesce, but her blood pressure gradually drops down to 89 over 41 with a MAP of 57. And as a result, she's given three liters of crystalloid, which transiently improves her blood pressure. But about an hour later, her blood pressure is back down to 88 over 32 with a MAP of 51, and her SATs are down. So she's satting about 90% and put on two liters of supplemental oxygen. So... Ms. Gonzalez is looking a little sick, Nick. Uh, how would you approach her? So first off, this is a very common story. This is somebody who comes in um, with an infection and probably was in shock initially, probably was in cryptic shock, and that became more overt with treatment. And you can almost imagine she got antibiotics, she had a bunch of GNRs in her, in her urine that started lysing and all of those broken down bacteria releasing fragments, triggering... Uh, toll-like receptors and causing cytokines, and this inflammation led to a greater drop in her BP. Um, and we can see that that you know initial blood pressure of 111 over 42 probably wasn't normal, both because of her history of hypertension, maybe her baseline actually runs higher than that, and because of the wide pulse pressure. 111 over 42 is pretty wide, and whenever you see that, right, that that often suggests um, a low diastolic or a wide pulse pressure, often suggests high cardiac output and low SVR. So there's a subtle physiologic clue there. So what do we do for Ms. Gonzalez? Well, we could assess fluid responsiveness. We could do a test like NICOM to see if she would benefit from more fluids. But I actually think the pretest likelihood of that is really low because we've given her fluid, right? She, you said she's 50 kilograms and she's gotten um, three liters. So that's 60 mils per kilogram. Um, that's, probably, that's probably enough of a fluid challenge. It's also pretty clear that she's only gotten a very transient benefit. So this is probably a good time to switch from boluses to vasopressors. 
Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask, ask her nurse to start norepinephrine. It's also a really good time to go back to the bedside and re-examine her and make sure we're not missing something. Does she have an undrained abscess? Is there some other etiology of shock also present? That's great, Nick. So we'll go ahead and start around five micrograms uh, per minute of norepinephrine or 0.1 mics per kg per minute for those that use weight-based dosing. And uh, fortunately for her, her blood pressure has improved a little bit. So she's now up to 97 over 43 or MAP 61. She feels better. She's more alert. Everything's looking a little bit brighter. What are we going to do now? Are we just going to set it and forget it with that five mics of Levo? Or are we going to titrate this face suppressor to something? So we obviously need to titrate it to something, right? This is, this is what critical care is. It's about titrating, titrating medications or interventions to an effect. But before we get to the numbers, let's talk about what our goal is. Our goal in resuscitating shock is to maintain sufficient oxygen delivery to sustain organ function. And I'm really encouraged by the fact that she's more awake, she feels better, right? That's a sign that her brain is better perfused now. Um, remember, vasopressors are very helpful when the problem is low SVR, and that's causing perfusion to suffer because we can raise SVR and restore that. In general, what I'd like to see is I'd like to see evidence that my patient's organs are well perfused. So we can see mental status, urine output, we can look at skin perfusion, and then we can also use labs like lactate, creatinine, delta CO2 to provide other useful insights. Let's revisit some of those. So in our first episode, we talked about how much information can be gleaned by the bedside, uh, the bedside evaluation really in a matter of seconds. Uh, I think we talked about walking into the room, you greet the patient, introduce yourself, you shake their hands. And, and really when you do that, uh, you're doing so much more. You're assessing their mental status, their overall appearance. You can feel for a bounding pulse. You can check cap refill pretty easily. Assess things like skin turgor and character all within moments, all just in the context of you introducing yourself to that patient. I think we both agree, Nick, that this is tremendously useful information. It's free to obtain. It's easy to obtain. We can do it and, and our nursing staff or techs or anyone else can do that every time they come into the room and say hello. Absolutely. That, that quick assessment can be done by, by anyone who takes care of sick patients, whether it's in the ward, the PACU, or the back of an ambulance. However, even though those are all very useful things, it's good to have some more objective data too. So what are those objective findings? Well, a lot depends on somebody's baseline. If somebody's got um, aneuric ESRD at baseline, we probably shouldn't expect a miracle and look at their urine output. But what else can we use? So first off, we often use MAP. We like MAP because that's really the pressure that perfuses organs. So it's a good thing to measure. We also like to use urine output. Um, important caveat to that is that urine output often takes many hours to recover once it's dropped off. Your kidneys are slow to trust you again if they've been hypotensive. So you shouldn't expect somebody's urine output to immediately recover after an episode of hypotension. Cap refill is good. We want to see less than two seconds there. Lactate is another good one. Um, and then just looking at labs in general, we want to see uh, no evidence of worsening liver function, coagulopathy. If we happen to have an ABG and a VBG, and I'm not saying that we should get both of those in this patient, but if we happen to have both, we can look at the delta CO2, and a wider delta CO2 can also suggest hypoperfusion. So we don't need to perseverate on any one of these numbers, but I think we should look at this sort of holistically. How is she doing when we look at her? How is she doing when we examine her? And then what is the general direction of all of these numbers? Blood pressure and heart rate are important, but there are many other measurables we need to consider. And I think this brings us to uh, perhaps one of the most important points of this episode, Nick, and that's something we actually, we did hammer home, I think, in our, in our first uh, ep episode or two, but you, you really do not have to be hypotensive to be in shock. Just like in this case, we have a patient who is hyper, hypertensive at baseline. And so their presentation uh, being normotensive, that could be falsely reassuring. But this patient, as you alluded to, Nick, is, was kind of already showing signs of shock. And that is a little shocking. Right. It's shocking. And, and we need to think of shock not as a state of, of blood pressure being a particular number, but as a state of inadequate oxygen delivery. And that's where this term cryptic shock comes from. You know, you'd mentioned cryptic shock earlier and I was kind of hung up on it. I, I thought that was an 80s rock band, you know, cryptic shock. That's right. Yeah. It's like four dudes with Algeria, long hair, ripped jeans, high lactate. Our lactate goes to 11. <laughs> yeah. That, I mean, that that is that is the quintessential, that is the quintessential missed shock situation. The person who looks bad but isn't hypotensive. And it's really important to frame your thinking on um on not just blood pressure, but on, on all these markers of organ perfusion. And it's important to remember that cryptic shock is actually really bad because it can lead to delays in diagnosis, delays in treatment, and all of those are associated with bad outcomes, particularly in situations like sepsis. Okay, so riddle me this though, can the converse be true, i.e. can you be hypotensive without being in shock? Absolutely. 
And there are many people who live their whole lives with a low blood pressure, right? Quote unquote hypotension at baseline. You know, this is, you know, there, there are people who have different cardiovascular physiology. There are people who are vasodilated at baseline, like people with liver disease. So I always like to look back through the clinic notes and see what somebody's blood pressure is on a good day, right? Remember that people with neurologic issues, single ventricle physiology, cirrhosis, et cetera, they, they exist with hypotension. They can have a blood pressure of 80 over 40 normally at rest. Uh, they don't need to be 120 over 80 to perfuse their organs because they're accustomed to that. So again, don't fixate on the number, look at the big picture. And if you want to look at the number, put that number in context. So go back through their records if you can see them and try to figure out what their normal blood pressure is. In this case, a patient with a history of, of hypertension makes me wonder, you know, is 111 over 42 normal for her or does she normally run higher than that? Yeah, I think that's a, a really important point. And, you know, just to revisit the our folks that have liver disease that that's an important one that we see not infrequently in the hospital in the ICU what have you and and uh, there are a lot of issues that that occur kind of a lot of hemodynamic issues that we see in liver disease uh, that we probably need to cover on a separate episode but at least germane to this topic is the fact that vasodilators are not metabolized normally and so these folks can be vasoplegic at baseline and they've adapted to that so just like you were saying, you know, these folks can be relatively hypotensive at baseline. They could have a blood pressure of 90 over 50, something like that. And they're not in shock. It's not physiologic, but they've grown to adapt to it. Right. And this is where the art of medicine comes in. Evaluating whether somebody is truly in shock or not, it's less about one particular number and it's more about sort of ass assessing the clinical gestalt. I would point out one minor detail though, which is that somebody whose blood pressure runs low has much less of a reserve. So they can tip over into shock with a relatively small drop in their blood pressure. So just remember, don't normalize the abnormal either right? Somebody whose normal blood pressure is 90 over 50 might be in florid shock at 80 over 40, whereas somebody else, a 10-point drop would not cause that kind of uh, change in organ perfusion. Well, that's all very helpful, Nick, and it sounds cool. We talk art of medicine and all that good stuff, but you know, at the end of the day, we've got our, our friendly neighborhood pharmacist who needs titration parameters. Our nurses need titration parameters. So how do we do that? How are we actually, um, you know, in, in no uncertain terms, how are you going to manage that norepinephrine drip? Yeah, I, I think that order would definitely get flagged if I said, you know, titrate to, you know, the uh, clinical gestalt using the art of medicine. So we probably we probably need to give <laughs> some objective criteria. Titrate to feels. Yeah, titrate to feels good, looks good, you know, physiologic contentment. Um, <laughs> so we we usually use a map of sixty five as a as a metric for this because we know that in almost everybody that provides enough perfusion for their brain, their coronaries, their kidneys. There's actually some recent evidence that suggests that maybe we can be a little bit lighter on this. Um, the so-called um, 65 trial compared a goal map of 60 to 65 with traditional higher goals, which were like above 65, so 65 to 75. And they found that in older people who were in early vasodilatory shock, titrating blood pressure, titrating vasopressors to a goal map of 60 to 65 had the same mortality as people who were titrated to a higher goal, like a map of 75. Importantly, though, people in the 60 to 65 map arm had a shorter duration of vasopressors by about five hours and similar rates of adverse events. So this strongly suggests that in selected patients, we can target a map of 60 to 65 and therefore maybe avoid the dose of vasopressor they're exposed to or the duration. One other thing, just to double click on the 65 trial, it's really interesting. So interestingly, they found that in the subgroup of people who had chronic hypertension at baseline, they actually did better if randomized to the permissive hypotension arm, that map greater than 60 arm. And that turns out is actually exactly like our patient here. This is somebody with chronic hypertension. And so I think targeting a map of above 60 is totally appropriate in this case. I think that's a, a good study to kind of put in your back pocket for, for patient care going forward. I, I find that I often tailor my MAP goals a little more than some of my other colleagues because I'm so used to using all those other tools in the toolbox to really assess the patient. You know, so if they're, if they're making great urine, if they are mentating, if cap refill is less than two seconds, labs are looking good, that lactate trend is a is a um, reassuring one that I'm not particularly worried if their map is 59 for a second you know or 60 61 so long as their trajectory is is a good one uh, it, but in order to do that I think you do really need to focus on the big picture and you can't really just hone in on one data point 
Um, so, you know, kind of in keeping with that, we, we do talk about MAP. We talk about MAP quite a bit. What's special about MAP? Why don't we talk about systolic blood pressures or dare I say diastolic blood pressures when we're trying to titrate our pressors? <laughs> Gasp, diastolic. Yeah, so I think <laughs> that's a really good question. I, I think usually we use MAP because we think that that is the best single parameter to measure organ perfusion for the brain, kidney, and gut. But it's not the only parameter. And we have to remember that, you know, for example, the heart is perfused during diastole. So in that, you know, a very low diastolic blood pressure is going to cause coronary ischemia. Um, and it might actually be reasonable to maybe target a higher diastolic, like keep it above, keep it above 40 in some folks. Another thing we should talk about too is this concept of perfusion pressure. So for example, you know, you can think about the renal perfusion pressure as your MAP minus your CVP. In somebody with heart failure whose CVP is really elevated and their MAP is really low, the amount of blood that their kidneys are getting is really low, right? You can imagine in a quote unquote healthy person, their MAP might be 65 and their CVP might be five. So their kidney is getting 60 millimeters of mercury of perfusion pressure. Whereas in somebody who's more congested, their CVP is 20 and their MAP is 55, now they're, now they're getting much less perfusion pressure. So this is another important consideration. If you have a CVP measurement, you can use that to sort of think about what your organs are seeing. And there are other perfusion pressures that we can talk about as well, probably in later episodes, but you can think about the pressure within compartments. So for example, the cerebral perfusion pressure, the perfusion in your, in your skull to your brain is your MAP minus your ICP. In somebody with a, who has a brain injury whose ICP is high, we totally want to make sure that their MAP is higher too to ensure adequate cerebral perfusion pressure. Um, we can also see something similar in the abdomen. In somebody with rising abdominal compartment pressures, we might want to push their MAPs a little higher. So to bottom line this, MAP of 60 to 65 is a reasonable goal in most people. But as you said, Cyrus, you got you to gotta personalize it to your patient. Um, some people tolerate low. Some people will have a MAP of 65 and look really terrible. And you might have to increase their MAP. And this sort of brings me to one of my favorite critical care points, right? Which is that everything in critical care ought to be a closed loop. You measure something, you do something, you measure again. And if you, if you feel like they're not perfused well and you raise their map to 70, let's say, with more pressors, um, and they look much better, that's a very clear sign that, th that this individual person might benefit from that. The caveat here is that map is only one endpoint, and we should use as many data points as possible when we do things like that. You know, I'm so glad you mentioned that uh, point on uh, the closed loop element of of medicine, especially critical care medicine. It just, just as an aside, it reminds me of, uh, you know, here recently in my hospital, we were doing some code blue team training and, and really the take home point that I kept hammering home is, you know, when we ask for something to get done, we need to know that it was heard and that it's been done and that needs to be communicated back to, you know, the team leader or whatever. And so it's, it's that idea of requesting an intervention having the intervention done, and most importantly, assessing for a response before we make another intervention. Because I think without that assessment, you're really not doing your patient any good. You're just sort of randomly doing things and hoping they work and then throwing mud at the wall to see what sticks. So I think that is a theme that is, is really pervasive in medicine. I'm glad we were able to, to, to touch on that, Nick. So uh, without getting too far into the weeds, I do want to get back to our case. You know, we've got uh, Ms. Gonzalez here who's waiting on our, on our next move. Um, so Ms. Gonzalez, <laughs> she's now got a map of 65. Uh, she is on eight micrograms per minute of norepinephrine. She's awake. She's looking a bit better. She's making urine. But of course, uh, the order fairy out there ordered a repeat lactate, and now it's gone from four to 4.5. So uh, Nick, how does that change your approach to a patient like this? What, uh, are you worried now? Oh boy. So lactate can of worms has been open. So, so, so classically, we're sort of taught that a normal lactate is less than two, and that's probably fine. But just like with many things, it's the trend that really matters. And titrating to a single parameter may not be the best way to go. So I think there's, we should also probably debunk this sort of almost mythic fear people have of lactate. You know, people sometimes see a high lactate number and they're really scared. And you got to remember a couple of things. First of all, lactate by itself is not harmful, right? If you, if you look at elite athletes like Olympic rowers, they get their lactate to greater than 25 um, with, with like a 2000 uh, meter erg. Right. So they're, and they're like the picture of health. So lactate by itself isn't bad. The thing that's bad about lactate is what is causing it. Right. Remember, this is a check engine light. So it should make you think about what's going on. 
And there are basically there are basically a couple of things that cause it. One is you're producing a lot of it, and two is you're not clearing it. And so sometimes you know you have to wonder if somebody is if somebody's lactate is rising, is this really a production issue or is this a clearance issue? And then and then finally, one other thing that we should mention, and this is like something that I see people make this mistake a lot. If you are giving somebody lactated ringers, it does not raise their lactate. But if you are giving somebody lactated ringers and then you draw blood through the line that was just infusing lac lactated ringers, it will give you a falsely high number. So the number of times that I've seen this where somebody has lactate values that one was normal when the, when the line was placed and then they got a liter of LR and then they checked it again by drawing back through that same line and then it was way higher. Uh, that's artifact. So first off, don't get too scared by lactate. Make sure it's a real measurement and put it in context. I think there's a few important points here. It's We've hammered this uh, point home initially with our episode on undifferentiated, uh, undifferentiated shock, but it's that um, it's that check engine light concept. You know, if I see that elevated lactate, I'm going to the bedside, I'm assessing the patient. That does not necessarily mean I'm going to do anything. I'm going to change what I'm doing. I'm going to, you know, start calling all the consultants to come on the sinking ship with me. No. Um, it means that I'm going to make a thoughtful assessment of the patient and try to figure out what's going on and, and what the cause is for this lactate. And, and part of that is determining whether this is a spurious elevation or if it's really a true elevation. And I think another point that that we've kind of make here is that there isn't anything wrong with lactate in and of itself. And in fact, it's it's an adaptive phenomenon, that elevated lactate. So for example, we know that myocardial energy during times of stress, like with that 2,000 meter rower, um, myocardial energy is derived in large part from lactate oxidation. That is, again, an adaptive phenomenon that allows that rower to keep rowing or, or allows that, that critically ill person to keep doing what they need to be doing. So yes, overall serum lactate should be a cause for, um, for thought, but not necessarily a thought for uh, a cause for concern. Um, we do have to consider things like poor oxygen delivery, high oxygen consumption, poor lactate clearance as causative factors, but, but it's all about being thoughtful, I think, when we, when we uh, assess our patients in situations like this. W would you agree with that, Nick? Absolutely. Well, well said, yeah. And, and just, just to add one, one other point to that is remember that sometimes a rising lactate is our fault, right? So if you put somebody on epinephrine or albuterol or other strong beta agonists like that, that can falsely – or that can – not falsely, that can raise your lactate, right? That's what those drugs do. And so don't – don't get scared if you put somebody on, you know, continuous nebs or an epi infusion. If their lactate is rising, that's that means the drug is working. It's doing what it's supposed to do. So bottom line, lactate is a lactate is a check engine light. Think about your patient. Don't freak out to that one number. There's nothing inherently toxic about lactate. It's more a marker of what could be going on underneath. And with that, I think we'll move along our case. Unfortunately for Ms. Gonzalez, she is doing a bit worse from a respiratory standpoint. Her oxygen saturations have now dipped to the low 80s, her respiratory rate's in the 40s, and she just looks uncomfortable. It may or may not have been the three liters of uh, crystalloid she got, who can say? Um, but whatever the case is, she was trialed on non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. That didn't really work out so well for her, and she is looking like she's going to need to be uh, intubated and mechanically ventilated. Unfortunately, she's looking a little tenuous. Her heart rate's in the 140s. Her blood pressure's 90 over 60 with a MAP of 70, but that is requiring uh, uh, 10 mics per minute of norepinephrine. So this is a patient who is uh, fixing to suffer a bit of a hit to their SVR as, as part of that RSI uh, intubation procedure. Uh, so how do you prepare for this? What do you do in terms of managing their vasopressors? In, and do you reach for push dose pressors in a situation like this? Yeah, great question. So I think push dose pressors are a really good option to have in your toolbox, and it's a really good tool in two situations. One, you need to raise a dangerously low blood pressure quickly, like somebody's blood pressure is 45 over 20, and they're, they're about to code. That's not a situation where you want to titrate a drip. The other situation where push dose pressors are useful is when the change in blood pressure is really transient. So for example, when somebody has just gotten a medication and it lowered their blood pressure, sometimes you can balance that with a little bit of push dose pressor. Now, intubation is one scenario where responding quickly to changing blood pressure is really important. And we, we have an upcoming episode where we're going to talk about the physiologically difficult airway. And we'll get a lot more into this then. But just to highlight the key points, there are several factors that contribute to hypotension with intubation. First off, 
your choice of intubation meds, your induction meds, particularly if you chose the wrong ones or you gave too high a dose. Second, often somebody who needs intubation is very sympathetically activated, right? Um, Miss Gonzalez, her heart rate is 140 right now. She's very sympathetically active. She's probably in distress, and that's contributing. When you when you sedate somebody so that they're unconscious and you can intubate them, a lot of that symp sympathetic tone goes away, and that can drop their blood pressure. Finally, there are things that happen with intubation itself. So if the person is hypoxemic or hypercapnic with induction, this can worsen your cardiac output and worsen your SVR. So this is particularly a problem in people who are really um, hypoxemic at baseline or really acidemic at baseline. And then finally, and this is a really important one to remember, is that positive pressure is different than negative pressure. When you put somebody onto a ventilator and you increase the pressure in their chest, this effectively reduces preload. And this can really affect people who are volume depleted. Now, I don't necessarily think that's what's going on with this patient, but it is a very important thing to remember that when somebody is under-resuscitated, intubating them can cause their blood pressure to drop because of the, the loss of preload effectively. And so push dose pressures can help with some of these issues, but they aren't a panacea. We really need to address all of those factors to make intubation as safe as possible. So a couple of things that I always do, right? I always have continuous vasopressors connected. It's much easier to take a drip, which is running at 10 and turn it up to 15 than it is to just start one out of the blue, especially if it's not inline flushed connected. Second, I always like to have a bolus ready to go. Um, sometimes because of that effective positive pressure on preload, they really just need 500 cc's of fluid to balance it out. And then finally, I always like to have push dose pressures at the ready whenever I'm intubating somebody with critical illness. You know, I think I think in this case, you know, the fact that she's got um, non-invasive uh, ventilation mask on means that she's probably well oxygenated and she's probably not acidemic. So we have to worry about those issues less. And I'm curious, you know, I like the practice of having vasopressor drip already running, even in folks who are sitting at, you know, a map of, let's say, let's say they, they are flirting with a map of 65 or less, but they're not quite there yet. And I'm intubating them more for respiratory distress. I'll often ask, Hey, can we just go ahead and get a bag of uh, levofed to, you know, four and two fifty? just get it running at, you know, one, one, two mics a minute. I, I don't, at least in my estimation, that is not going to hurt them. And it's going to at least keep that line open for if I really need to up the dose kind of quickly, uh, I've got it to fall back on. Is that is that something that you do or is that a practice that makes sense in your eyes? Absolutely. I do, I do that a lot. And I think psychologically, it's much easier to titrate from two to five than it is to titrate from zero to two, right? There's just more yeah. of a roadblock to starting a medication, even if it's already in the room. And so I, yeah, I, I do the same thing. I think a, a low dose continuous vasopressor when you intubate somebody is, is a great idea, especially in somebody where you're anticipating hypotension afterwards. Beautiful. Thanks for, thanks for validating me, Nick. I'm always, I'm always looking for validation. All right. <laughs> Anytime, buddy. <laughs> I appreciate it. So, um, we'll go ahead and continue with the case. So of course we give uh, one of our favorite drugs, ketamine as part of our intubation cocktail, as well as some rocuronium. And we intubate her fortunately without difficulty. Her blood pressure immediately prior to intubation was 90 over 60, but now she's down to 50 over 30 and, uh, her heart rate's looking like it's dropping just a little bit. Are we just going to ride it out or are we going to do something about this, Nick? Yeah. So I, I think, uh, it would be a mistake to just turn up the norepi and wait a couple of minutes for that to work. I think this is a situation where there's been an acute, dangerous drop in blood pressure where we need to act quickly. And so in this case, there's basically three three options that we could use. We could use phenylephrine, we could use epinephrine, or we could use vasopressin. Now, in this case, she doesn't have a central line yet, she has a peripheral line, so I would not use vasopressin. And so the question is, do you want to use um, a push of phenylephrine or epinephrine? I think they're both good choices. Phenylephrine, like 100 to 200 mics, epinephrine, 20 to 50 mics are both good. Um, in general, if the person is already pretty hypertensive, uh, pretty uh, tachycardic, I will reach more for phenylephrine. And if they're and if they're not, especially if they're breaking down, I'll reach for epinephrine. But perfection is the enemy of the good here. So I think one one really important thing to think about is like you know getting this ready before you intubate. And so as part of our pre intubation briefing, I always talk to the team what our contingency plan is going to be. And fortunately, where I work, we have pre-mixed syringes of both low-dose epi and phenylephrine. 
So you can, you can safely give those drugs quickly, but I, you know, it's always good to talk about if the blood pressure drops, I want you to give a hundred mics of phenylephrine. And then if it drops more, we'll give more. Or if the blood pressure drops and they're really bradycardic, I want you to give 20 mics of epi. Um, and I think planning for it reduces the activation energy to give that life-saving push um, when it actually happens. So I, you know, you, I had a question uh, based on that decision between phenylephrine and epinephrine because I've seen folks, and I mean, I've done this myself. You know, when we when we're just getting to know the patient, we don't know a whole lot about them. We don't really know anything about their uh, their heart history necessarily. Like it's let's say it's really early on, and the fog of war is still quite thick. Sometimes I worry about giving folks phenylephrine in particular, giving them that unopposed alpha and possibly worsening their cardiac function at a time when they need every, you know, cardiac myocyte they can get. In that setting, in that acute setting, is that something I really need to worry about? Do I get a free pass on that? How do you how do you approach those patients where you're, you've, you've yet to really identify what their cardiac reserve is like, what their cardiac function is like, but you, you have to do something kind of quickly? Yeah. So, I, I mean, this is why it's great to look at somebody's heart with point of care ultrasound um, early on so you can get a sense of what their what their cardiac output is. If you don't know it, yeah, I if, if you don't know, you, I guess you could use either. You know, if, if you know that they're if you if you know that they have a depressed cardiac output at baseline, I think it's very reasonable to use like a low dose push of epinephrine as your as your choice. Yeah, yep. you know, if you know that their that their systolic function is normal, phenylephrine is a great choice. Um, I don't think I don't think either one is wrong, but I share your concern. Like if you if you know that somebody's if, if you if you're worried about somebody needing a little bit more squeeze, I agree with using epinephrine as your push. Awesome. Thanks, Nick, for, for fleshing that out. Yeah. So a couple of points, maybe just to emphasize a little bit more here. So use premixed syringes. Absolutely never try to take a syringe of one to 10,000 epi and push half of a milliliter. That is a recipe for a dangerous overdose under stressful conditions, right? Somebody is going to push too much. Your patient will have a tacky dysrhythmia. So don't do that. Um, take 30 seconds to mix it beforehand, or better yet, get your hospital to get you pre-mixed syringes of low-dose epinephrine and phenylephrine. It's so much easier to give that. It's so much faster. Highly recommend. Second, much better to give a couple small doses than one big slug, right? Our goal is to get somebody out of this acute danger zone, not necessarily to make their blood pressure normal immediately. And so if we have to give them, you know, two or three doses of 100 mics of phenylephrine or two or three doses of 20 mics of epinephrine, that's okay. Better, better, you know, better to do it in a couple in increments than to give way too much too fast. In this case, the patient was already on a continuous infusion of pressors. We should probably do two things at once here. We should give some push dose pressor and we should turn up the infusion. This person is probably going to need more pressors after, after induction, so we might as well turn up the continuous drip now. And then finally, if you are doing something acutely, you need to be monitoring acutely too. So don't have that blood pressure cuff cycling every 15 minutes. It should be cycling like every one minute. And you should probably think about whether you need an arterial line too. I often, in somebody where I'm worried about them, um, but they're not, they don't need to be intubated right this second, and I have a few minutes, I'll often put in an arterial line so that I can monitor them more closely with induction if I think it's going to be high risk. So just remember that if you're giving pushes, you need to be monitoring blood pressure very rapidly too so you can make that that loop we talked about really tight. I think that is such an important point, Nick, and that's very much my practice as well. If I have a patient in the intensive care unit and I I foresee a a reasonable possibility that they're going to need to be intubated um, and potentially suffer that transient drop in SVR as a function of the medications I need to give them, I'll often put in a radial arterial line and have that in place so that I don't need to think about that step prior to intubation. They're, they're technically fairly easy to put in. They're fairly low risk. They can provide some useful data. They can provide access for blood draws. And most importantly, that that beat to beat monitoring in the setting of uh, an acute situation, I think is really, uh, really helpful to have. So um, absolutely. C couldn't agree more. Perfect. Moving on, moving on from there. Um, so we'll go ahead and say that uh, Ms. Gonzalez, she's been successfully intubated, safely intubated. She did have that transient drop in her blood pressure, but we expertly managed that. And now she's been stabilized on 10 micrograms per minute of norepinephrine. So now that we're here, she's intubated and, and the dust has settled. Do we need to put in a central line? 
this is a this is an area where practice patterns have changed a lot over the last decade and and I think all for the better. So when I was a resident, um, you know, we would do weird stuff. Like we would wait until the line was in to give pressors. And so sometimes patients would be intubated. They would have gotten like eight liters of crystalloid because it was taking a while to get the line. And I, I just don't think that that makes sense. There is really robust evidence that you can give vasopressors through a peripheral IV safely if you take appropriate precautions. And so we should not be afraid to do that if we can do it safely. Let's talk about what that means. So first off, you have to use a good IV. Don't put vasopressors into somebody's thumb vein. The danger here, of course, is extravasation. If, if your IV fails and that vasopressor medication leaks out into the tissue, it can cause um, all of the microvasculature to, to constrict and it can cause tissue ischemia. And that can cause either local necrosis or even really severe necrosis could cause the person to lose a limb. So that is no joke. But if you use a good IV and you have the right protocol, we can make the risk of that exceedingly low. So what do I mean? First off, use a reasonably big IV. So use an 18 or 20 gauge, one that flushes and draws, okay? Don't use like a 24 gauge. Second, <laughs> avoid those high risk areas where either there's high risk of the IV getting dislodged or it's hard to assess. So for example, don't put don't use an IV that's in the hand or the wrist or in the AC or above. You really got to use something that's in the forearm. If the IV was placed by ultrasound, you want to make sure that it was placed into a vessel that was at least four millimeters in diameter. And you should look and make sure that the catheter is not taking up more than 50% of the vessel. If the if it's a tiny vessel or the catheter is really clogging the whole pipe, the likelihood of it getting thrombosed and failing is higher. And then finally, and this is maybe the most important aspect of this, you and everyone involved in caring for this patient on peripheral pressors needs to know what to do if this IV fails. So, you know, before we get to how you manage that, is there a specific presser that you find is preferable with respect to peripheral access? Yeah, that's a good question. And I think there's a lot of mythology here. So I've, I've heard people say things like phenylephrine is safer. I've heard people say, well, dopamine is safer. That's why it's in the crash carts. By the way, dopamine's in the crash carts because it's, it's temperature um, stable. So it doesn't have to be refrigerated. That's the only reason. It has nothing to do with peripheral safety. For, I would say that all catecholamine vasopressors are safe if you take appropriate precautions. Several studies have shown that giving a single agent through a PIV is, is very unlikely to cause complications. Um, but no matter how safe, there's no pressure that you want to extravasate. And so, you know, does it, does it really matter which one? Well, I, I would say probably not uh, among the catecholamine vasopressors. The one exception to that is I think physiologically or pharmacologically, you might think that epinephrine might be a little safer peripherally because it has a balance of alpha and beta-2 effects, which means that it's probably less likely to cause that microvascular ischemia because if it extravasates, those beta-2 effects will balance out the constriction. I, there's no study on this, but there is kind of the, the very large observational study, which is millions of people walking around with EpiPens. And the whole point of EpiPens is to inject a relatively high dose of epinephrine into muscle and sub -Q. So, you know, I don't think that I don't think that if you're if you're giving pressors peripherally, it changes your your choice among the catecholamine vasopressors. I would still give norepinephrine most of the time. You don't have to use um, phenylephrine or dopamine because they you think they'd be better. I think if we really get into the the pharmacology weeds, maybe we can convince ourselves that epinephrine is maybe a little bit safer. But again. Just don't have it extravasate. Use a good IV, and then you don't have to worry about that issue. That's perfect. You know, an ounce of uh, prevention is worth a pound of cure in that regard. So we we talked about what we would put in that peripheral IV. Are there specific drugs that you want to warn us about, Nick, in regards to what we don't want to put in a peripheral IV from, from a vasopressor standpoint? Yeah, that's a great way. To, that's a great way to frame it, Cyrus. So so um, the catecholamine vasopressors, norepinephrine, epinephrine, phenylephrine. I think those are all fine in a peripheral IV if you if you use a good IV. What I would not put into a peripheral IV pretty much ever are non-catecholamine vasopressors. So for example, I would not push vasopressin peripherally. And there's a really simple reason for this. There's an antidote if norepinephrine, phenylephrine, epinephrine extravasates. There isn't an antidote for vasopressin. So if something goes wrong, I have no way to fix the problem. So I would say if somebody needs vasopressin, they need, they need better access.
Correct. You know, I'm glad we touched on that. Uh, we, I think, generally would say extravasation is relatively rare, assuming we follow those uh, guidelines from from before, big IV, right site, et cetera, et cetera. But kind of like the Boy Scouts, I, I think we always want to be prepared. So if you're going to use a peripheral IV for vasopressors, I think knowing how to treat extravasation is really important uh, for whatever agent you're using. And in fact, I've been an advocate of including the medication and the nursing orders with my vasopressor order just to make sure there's no delay in the eventuality of, of a vasopressor extravasation. Mm. So Nick, how do you approach that uh, if, if, the, uh, if an extravasation event were to occur? Yeah. So this is something that we, we all need to have sort of drummed into us. So we know what to do. You don't want to be like looking this up on up to date. You want to just know it. This is kind of bold, bold face stuff. So the, the antidote is a medication called fentolamine. It's an alpha blocker. It reverses the vasoconstrictive effects of the presser. And I think of this as kind of three steps. First off, stop the infusion, right? Stop it, disconnect the IV, but leave that catheter in. Now take a syringe, put it on there and try to draw back any liquids you can out of the catheter right? Not only are you not going to make it worse, but maybe you can get rid of some of the pressors that are still in there. Now, leaving the catheter in, inject fentolamine into the IV. Inject a bunch so it comes out the end of the IV, and then slowly pull the catheter out while you inject more. So this gets antidote into the area that was leaking. And then a little tip that I like to do is I like to take the catheter that I've just removed and kind of lay it down on the skin so I can see exactly where the tip was. Now, using a really small, like a 23, 25 gauge needle, inject more fentolamine there where the tip of the catheter was and kind of in a, an area surrounding it. So you can kind of think of this as like a clock face. You want to inject, you know, at that area, but you also want to inject like up at 12, over at three, down at six, over at nine. And the idea here is any vasopressor that has leaked out of there and spread into that tissue, you're going to get some antidote out into the surrounding tissue as well. And then finally, this is a situation where you don't you you want to monitor very closely, right? So mark off the area if you can see a change in coloration, mark it off with a a pen and then reassess it frequently. So if someone had an extravasation event and you've managed it as such, would you just go ahead and switch their norepinephrine line to another peripheral IV and and just pick back up from where you left off? I mean, in the in the moment when it happened, right? Like, so if they're if they're um, hypotensive without pressors, they need pressors. Yes, P hook it up to another another peripheral. But this is a situation where this person has kind of shown you that they're high risk for having an extravasation complication. So I would want to get definitive access pretty much right away. If somebody is sick enough to need pressors, and especially like in our case where this patient is intubated, I usually go ahead and just place a central line at that at that point. Usually if somebody is this sick, they tend to require a longer duration of pressors anyway. And don't forget, there are certain advantages to central lines. Absolutely. I think that's a good point. I, I typically, it's uncommon, uh, I don't know, maybe not uncommon, but I would say it is common for me to intubate a patient and immediately while they're still relatively deeply sedated and paralyzed to just go ahead and put that central line in as well. Um, it certainly facilitates blood draws, which I think is helpful. It, it gives you that flexibility if the patient needs multiple basoactive medications or, or what have you down the road. So I think, I think in those situations, it's certainly something to think about. Uh, definitely don't need to do it for everyone. If you feel like you, like you, you've got good peripheral access and you're able to, to roll with it, but that's, that's just sort of my practice is, is oftentimes I'm reaching for a triple lumen in addition to reaching for that endotracheal tube. So, um, yeah, I, I agree. I think, I think usually if somebody is that sick, it, it's a good time to, it's a good time to place a central line while they're sedated and they, they won't, they won't be uncomfortable from it. What about, uh, what about pick lines and mid lines, Nick? One of our listeners had, had brought that up and kind of wondering about vasopressors being given through a pick or given through a midline. Uh, emphatic yes to both. So picks are very similar to central lines in terms of the extravasation risk, which is to say extremely low. Uh, and we also have at least three pretty good observational studies showing that the risk of extravasation with midlines is also very low. So remember before I said like it should be in your forearm, I guess the exception to that is a midline that's flushing and drawing um, that's performing that's performing properly. That midline is probably also extremely low risk. Um, so the bottom line is both picks and midlines are good options for pressors without a central line. That said, just because you can use a peripheral IV doesn't mean 
you have to. And I think central lines do have a role. There's lots of great things about them. You mentioned some of them. You know, I think remember that these patients are often on antibiotics. So they're going to have multiple different meds that have to go at the same time that may be incompatible. They're often on sedation if they're on a ventilator. There's just there's a lot of advantages. And then it also facilitates blood draws. It lets us check an SCVO2. So I think, you know, I, I, there, there's, a, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of reasons to place a central line. It's just think about the situations where you can delay placing it um, or maybe patients who, who are really not that sick where you don't need to place it. You know, just because somebody is on pressors doesn't mandate a uh, central line. That's that's a great point. The other thing we didn't mention this, but I'll, I'll mention it too, is CVP monitoring with a central line. If you're using that to determine your renal perfusion pressure, for example, uh, I, I find that that can be a, a helpful tool in the toolbox when you're assessing a patient like this or other patients. So it, I think they certainly have utility beyond just uh, just just vasopressors. Absolutely. I, I think I, I think CVP gets a bad rap, and I think it gets a bad rap in the setting of Manny Rivers' sepsis protocol, where it was used probably not so appropriately as a fluid resuscitation endpoint. CVP is a terrible fluid resuscitation endpoint, but it's not a useless number. It's not a useless value. It does tell you things about filling pressures in the right heart. And so if you have a central line and you don't need, let's say it's a triple lumen, you don't need all three lumens for meds, absolutely hook up that CVP line to a pressure transducer because it can give you useful information. So Nick, I think we've covered a lot here, uh, probably ran a little bit over our target time, but that's okay. I think this is all good stuff. Um, and, and fortunately now for Ms. Gonzalez, she has that central line and is on her way from the ED to the intensive care unit. So we'll we'll pick back up in our, our next vasopressor episode with Ms. Gonzalez and, and her journey through the, the uh, ICU, which I'm pretty excited about and hopefully our, our audience is too. But before we move on to that, I do want to summarize some of the great points we discussed here from part one. Um, really, we talked about what vasopressors are and when to start them. We talked about the different types of vasopressor, the different categories, um, spent some time demystifying some of that. And then the next step, I think we we really talked about choices of vasopressors and when we might use one over the other and, and specifically focused on why norepinephrine is often a good choice as your first line presser, especially if you don't really know what's going on in those undifferentiated shock patients. The, um, the rest of the, the episode, I, I think we talked uh, in depth on push dose vasopressors, their, their utility in the setting of rapid sequence intubation or other procedures that we expect to cause transient drops in SVR, uh, and also the use of push dose pressors in those emergent situations where we don't have time to titrate the, uh, the drip. Um, and then finally, we covered the, the age-old question of, can you give vasopressors peripherally? Do you need a central line, pick line, mid line? Who knows? Uh, I, I think that... Uh, we did a good job discussing that, or I hope we did anyway, and I guess our audience will, will let us know if we, uh, if we did, uh, did right by them. Yeah, well, we really hope you enjoyed the show. Um, be sure to tune in for our next episode when we follow uh, our patient upstairs. You know, you can kind of think of part one as the care beginning in the emergency department. She gets pressors. Her pressors get up titrated. She needs push dose pressors. She needs a central line. We're going to follow her upstairs next, and we're going to talk about some other issues like adding a second and third presser, what to do when the presser isn't working properly, what are some alternatives or adjuncts. And then finally, we're going to talk about as she starts to get better, how we can wean pressers. So anyway, if you liked part one, I hope you, I hope you will like part two too. I think there's a lot of great stuff there. Absolutely. We hope you like this episode. We hope you like the season so, so far. If you do, make sure to subscribe, give us a like, and please, please leave us a five-star review uh, on whichever your favorite podcast app may be. This helps us tremendously expand our audience, and it really does mean the world to us. So, so thank you so much in advance. We read every comment and smile every time. Be sure to check out our website, www.criticalcaretime.com, where you can find the podcast, videos, infographics, and show notes. You can tweet at us at Critical Care Time <laughs> or at Nick M. Mark or at Askins underscore Razor. You can also follow us on Instagram, critical underscore, underscore care underscore time. And be sure to check out our Critical Care uh, Time YouTube channel as well. And our Threads account also, which is uh, Critical Care Time. So we can you can check that out too. Oh yeah, Threads, forgot that. Yeah. Threads for sure. Yeah. Trying to expand our reach uh, near and far. So um, 
you know, we would be uh, we'd be remiss not to mention our fantastic sponsor for this episode and, and all episodes in season one of Critical Care Time. So we are fortunate to have C-Star Medical on board uh, supporting us during the season. C-Star Medical is advancing the science of cell-directed extracorporeal therapy to help restore the balance of a dysregulated immune system in acute kidney injury and sepsis. Please check out their website, cstarmedical.com, to learn more. And before we go, we'd like to thank all the incredible members of our team for making this possible. We couldn't do it without them. To thank the production team over at Podpaste. Um, thank uh, Kurt Belknap for our amazing theme music. Um, yeah, it takes a village. So thank you, everybody. And lastly, this podcast and all related media, including but not limited to animations, graphics, and videos are the property of Critical Care Time. Please, please share our content near and far. We just ask that you cite your source. The views expressed within the podcast and any associated media do not necessarily reflect the views of our employers. All references to patients or encounters have been modified to be HIPAA compliant, and thus any similarities to real world cases are indeed coincidental. Finally, this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only and should not be used in lieu of seeking medical advice. With that, I've been Dr. Cyrus Askin. And I've been Dr. Nick Mark. See you all soon.